Well, um, merci. Thank you for coming. And I would like to begin just by uh, a very short biographical notes to our guests. I think Dr. Cornette has been long introduced through the film, and I think you know a lot about him. And uh, I would just like to say that my experience of having participated in one of the sessions and having uh, basically seen you and worked with you throughout these years in the art community, how important it's been for your presence and how important, how much I've learned through that experience. Um, the filmmaker, Aranis Abongsawin, and I'll be more formal because the film is very much about Dr. Cornett, but we are in the presence of a great documentary filmmaker. Um, Alanis is of Abenaki descent. She has made over 30 important documentaries throughout her career. Probably the best known documentary is the Kanesatake 270 Years of Resistance in 1990 around the siege of Oka in Quebec. She has gone on to create many films. And I'm not going to list them all. I just think that in many of our own minds and our histories, we are aware of that work. And we are standing in awe in relationship to it. Um, I had the privilege of seeing the film when it was first aired at L'ONF. Uh, basically participated as an audience member to the Q&A section, which I hope will be open and animated at this point. But I would like to uh, just take this opportunity just to create maybe the open parentheses as the time has gone on now. It's been three years since the film. The film <coughs> brings us to about 2008, 2009. And I would just like to know if you wanted to add anything in relationship to the history of the film, where the film has gone, how it's been viewed, and in relationship to your own work, Dr. Cornett, in terms of dialogical sessions, how that's developed, and if there's anything else you would like to add before we proceed with the q and I'd love to hear Ms. Obama's one. Okay. <laughs> um, well, every time I look at the film, I, I feel it's a there's so much that has happened after, but when I look at the film, I always feel it's quite complete in, in terms of the story and what happened and the wonderful students uh, who contributed in being interviewed. It was uh, not an easy experience, but a really very important in my, in my life. I'm very happy that I ended up directing the film. The idea really came from uh, Bob Darrow and uh, Ivan Semensky, who were uh, both producers on the film. And uh, they asked me if I would direct it. And mainly because I was aware of the uh, style of Dr. Cornet. I'd been in his class many times over the years, but I think starting 2001. So I knew a lot of the students and they met me through if they were watching a film I, that I had made, and they would write about it, and then Dr. Cornette would ask me to come in front and <laughs> go and sit there and, and give the comments. It was never very easy, but uh, it was wonderful. By the time uh, I decided that I was going to make the film, and all the students that were asked that I wanted to interview knew me. They knew who I was, and they knew my style of making films, so it was a very nice relationship with all the students. So, um, yes. One of the things that struck me at the last screening, which was the screening at the Gwinnett, and I think they were, they were your closing comments, and for me they still resonate very much because, and I would like to just preface them as beginning comments for me here, is that having witnessed this film and saw it, you talked about the impact of white education on First Nations, and we are very aware of that history and the history of that education. And I think that it's a very strong testament in relationship to mm. the crisis that we face in education throughout history and at the present right now. So I remember you saying that, and I just want to reiterate it right now as, as an echo of someone who heard it and remembers it clearly. Yes, when I first came to uh, Dr. Collins' class, that's what really uh, impressed me the most to, to have respect towards the students, to make them feel that they can also teach you something, that there is an exchange, that the students were allowed to bring um, who they were, what nation they came from, their 
the respect towards um, the people in the classroom, the person in your own, because uh, where I came from, the school that I went to, and that all our people went to, certainly was not like that. We never heard of such a, <coughs> such a way of learning. And um, that is the main reason why I really accepted to make it there, because I, was, I think all people who sit in the classroom should feel that, that they belong, should feel that they have something to say, should feel that whoever they are, or whatever nation they come from, should be respected. And I think that's the root of really learning. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Cornett, is there anything as far as the models of education that you pursued in dialogical sessions? I know you've continued them outside of obviously McGill, and you've pursued them internationally in Europe mm -hmm. and in Montreal through art galleries and other venues. Is there anything else you want to add? Well, I'd like to do a Nike, that is to say, just do it. So why don't we do it here? There's only one wrong question. That's the unasked question. Il n'y a qu'une seule mauvaise question. Celle qu'on ne pose pas. So let's dialogue. What questions do you have? Anything goes. <laughs> Ms. Lemus Coda. Uh, maybe what I'm curious about is that, I don't know, there's a link that was made to like the 60s era and this idea of like empowerment and, um, and I was wondering um, if, if a lot of the students who are coming out of McGill, they're being taught a certain way. Is there, and collectively, if Maybe I'm wondering what your impression might be of like future students. I know like there's that idea of like being positive and thinking that students will like you know be themselves, but I don't know. Do you find that I don't know. I guess maybe I'm sort of curious about that, like the way that students are being educated today if, if yeah, yeah. I just I just felt a little bit, you know, Concern that you know, if if a university that it, like is held in great regard um, isn't able to you know provide a reason for or turn out these kids who think a certain way, and that's not to say that people are not independent thinkers, but I'm wondering what will happen you know for like kids who didn't experience you know this liberation, didn't experience you know growing up in, during an era that perhaps may have like inspired you to do what you do today? Is that clear enough? Or it's very clear. No, no, Ms. Lemus Kodo, first of all, excuse me, I think best standing up, so I apologize for that. But um, first of all, you're quite observant. Uh, I was born in 1950. I lived through segregation in the United States. And when you're a child and you see that people are divided on the basis of color, it goes deep. So the sensitivity to which Ms. Obamsoen refers, this is right back at the roots of my childhood in the United States. As, a, as an adolescent, seeing Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. This is my model. Um, also, I went to UC Berkeley, and I went there when everything was up for grabs. I mean, we would have classes on the roof um, you know that song, Let's Do It on the Street? We did it. <laughs> um, you have to understand what Berkeley was like, so you're very astute in noting that my reference frame for education is Berkeley in the 60s. Yeah, well, because, I mean, uh, just recently with, like, um, the, uh, sort of, like, the protests that a lot of students are doing, I've been doing a stage, and it's been on the West Island, and the way that people have been thinking is, you know, the students, you know, are not deserving to protest, there isn't really anything that they're fighting for, they should just get off their lazy asses and just go to work. So I find that while we do promote, um, while there is like overall this idea of like promoting liberties and such, there's always a kind of like, just, sh just shut up and, and work. I don't know. So that's... I don't know well, th there's two things I would say there. First of all, civil disobedience and non-violent resistance. These are part of the cores of my understanding. As an American, 
I'm part of a generation that went out in the millions to stop the war in Vietnam. And it worked. But it means mobilizing everybody. We have a choice. We don't have to sit on our ASSs and just take it. We indeed have a civic duty. Question back. Yeah, I, I admire your courage. I was going to school up north of you during the time you were in Berkeley. I was at Reed. Oh, great school. Yeah. In Portland. Yeah, I was a dissident voice at Reed, however. Anyway, my question is this. And again, I mean this with all respect. The kind of reputation that Lionel Groove has in the Jewish community is not very savory. Um, he's known as an anti-Semite. I am prepared to be educated on this. I would like to hear what you learned about him and how that part of his persona, if that is in fact true, how you integrated that. In the first place, is it true? And in the second place, how did you integrate that information? Okay, that, uh, are you a professor or a student? Or? What do you think? <laughs> I, I'm a professor. Oh, great. Well, first of all, thank you. Um, Reed, incidentally, is a great place. I was teaching in Portland in the fall. Um, most enjoy that experience. Second of all, my PhD thesis is 425 pages. Um, so to be able to encapsulate it in a nanosecond is impossible. One entire chapter is over a hundred pages on Lionel Gru and anti-Semitism. Uh, I did publish a book with Gérard Bouchard of the Bouchard-Taylor Commission and other scholars, en français, qui s'intitule Un héritage controversé. Let me give you the short answer. Lionel Gru did a, a doctorate first in theology. He did a second doctorate in philosophy. He did a third doctorate in history. Lino Gru was a priest, and he studied the Bible in Hebrew, he studied the Bible in Greek, he studied the Bible in Latin. Much of what I respond to, and it's considered, nobody's ever done this work before, and that's why um, it's been published in a number of academic journals and scholarly reviews. The phenomena of supersessionism, ladies and gentlemen, I can, well, what it means is the Christians have replaced the Jews. They are God's people. I can show you verses, paragraphs, chapters in which Lino Gru says that the French Canadians are the Jews of the New World. That's a short answer. <laughs> Other questions? Uh, uh, what are your reasons uh, behind letting your students have pseudonames and anonymity, anonymity when you're reading their reflections, when you're trying to teach them to be honest with themselves and the world? Like, don't you, do you think they're in contravention, or, or do you think it's just that students aren't ready for it? I think there's a few points here. One is how do we demythologize the university classroom? By that I mean create a non-threatening environment. Why did I say the only wrong question is the unasked question? How many of us are afraid to ask the stupid question? So the minute you, you diffuse the stupidity factor, and you say we're demythologizing, we're creating a level space where Ms. Obamsuan, who, as Professor More Morelli has pointed out, Ms. Obamsuan is Canada's foremost native filmmaker. She's a leading feminist in Canada, and she's an internationally renowned documentary filmmaker. So how can you dialogue with her? She's a giant. <laughs> <laughs> So, so you create this level playing field where we relate as human beings. And the anonymity, because, you know, when you know you're not going to be, you effed up. 
when you know the finger's not going to be pointed, that you're not going to be focused on, then we can start to talk brass tacks. So I would read, and I mean, Ms. Obamson, I'll let her explain some of her experiences. When I first read what my students, quote unquote, really think of Native peoples. I'm just going to ask a question following that, because you, you were a student of Dr. Cornett, so I'm just curious for someone who bore a fictitious name or a given name, and this has been years since then. And I'm wondering how much of the thing you talk about theater in your teaching, and you're, you're very dramatic, and the theater is very <laughs> present, mm -hmm. that when these people take on character names, does it free them in a way to speak in a way that's different than themselves? Is that what you're talking about? And how much does the notion of play come into it in terms of the theatrical scene that's set up? And do you have a pseudonym for them, for yourself? Yeah. When you're for thinking? myself? Yeah. In, in, the, in Ms. Obamsuan's film, my, um, our theme was Forrest Gump, uh, the film, and I would show them an excerpt, and we called ourselves as a learning community, and I believe we're all learning together. It's not magisterially the prof's on high and he's dispensing truth. We're, we're, we're journeying together through knowledge and experiences. Well, in, in, in Box of Chocolates, um, we were Forestians and, Gump, um, and Gumperites, and um, my name was Bubba. Because if you see the film Forrest Gump, Bubba is your very best good friend. And that's what I want to be as a professor. I want to be your very best good friend. Now, about the names, the greatest gift a pedagogue can give to a student is to allow, permit them and create an environment where they can articulate their own identity. And that's, that was part of it. And if we want to get academic on this, particularly because we've had a course on, um, I, was, I had the privilege of being here Friday night and hearing the discussion on women and the arts. I highly recommend Angela Davis, Blues Legacies and Black Feminism. She has an entire chapter on the power of naming. It is so powerful to name someone or something. So what happens when you are empowered to create your own identity. And the one thing that really struck me is that as a product of the system, what is the faculty, the distinguished faculty, I, I don't mean fine arts or political science, I mean, what is the ability that we as a species have that distinguishes us from all other creatures? Creativity defines us. So I began to look, how can we create a space where each student can develop their creativity? Okay, uh, start over here. Yeah, I've got a follow-up question. Uh, um, you, in, in a classroom situation, uh, people have chosen their name. <coughs> Yet there's this formalism uh, when we, so, and I've noticed in other people that uh, uh, that you interact with, it's always uh, with the family name and it's Mr. Or Mrs. and so on and so forth. So how does that fit in with uh, you know outside of the classroom situation in, in, a, in, a, in the public situation? Why do you use the, the family? Name? Yeah, that, that, that's that's a that's a fair question. <laughs> um, first of all, because. The establishing that level playing field means that we all articulate our identities in appropriate names for ourselves. However, as you see in the film, I regularly deal with people like, like Lucien Bouchard and his brother, Gérard Bouchard, um, the Prime Minister of Canada, the Right Honorable Paul Martin. I don't take anything for a given. And I think out of respect, I want to reflect that respect. I've never called Ms. Obamswin any other name than Ms. Obamswin. And that's out of respect. And I want to I want to communicate respect. There's something back. 
So my question is for Ms. Longswan. Um, that a week goes by that I don't have experience here in Montreal, or that I don't see something on the internet, and I think to myself, if I were a documentary filmmaker, I would love to make a movie about that. There's so much to talk about. How do you choose the topics for your films? Very good. When you decide to make a film, there's a, you have to um, concentrate on what is the core of the story. And never to forget that part, because otherwise you can very easily go all over the place, and then the story is not so understandable for the people who are going to be watching it. You have to know what are the reasons, what is the real fundamental reason why you're doing it. And it's from there, it always comes back, that is the story. So that you, when you are sitting there watching it, watching it, you can really understand where we're going with this story, what's happening here. Not jumping to a total different thing where you say, well, why are we watching this for? It doesn't make any sense. And it's very difficult because as you work, as you are shooting a film, there's many other things that happen and that you would like to, as you say, you would like to take a, a photograph or an image of what's going on on the street. It's uh, happening right before you. It's beautiful all over. So you have to really be careful to, to stand by that story, the core of it. But how do you choose the story in the first place? There's so many stories to be told. Well, in my case, uh, it's usually because something very important, injustice happens somewhere when I'm concerned and I want to help out. And in my case, uh, I made 37 films so far and 35 of them are all about our people. I made the one about doc Dr. Cornette and I made, made another film that does not concern our people about a center in Montreal that receives people of all ages and of all nationality. It's called uh, the Patrol de People. It's a center in, in the northeast town here. Um, I don't like injustices towards anybody, whether it's my own people or Jewish people French people or English people, I, I can't stand it. And I'm, I'm not different from a lot of people. But to get up and do something is another story. When you decide you're gonna go walk because you, something's going on that you believe is wrong, you do it. And I am the same. And there's so many stories I cannot do everything that I'm asked to do or that I would like to do. Um, but I do everything I can and I will for as long as I have my health. I'm going to be 80 years in August. <laughs> it doesn't show. <laughs> but I want to tell you that I love every moment of my work. I'm just very passionate about it. I love people, and I will sit in front of any individual. Any one of you here, I could make a film about you, and we could make a good one. You know what? I tell you what. It's because my ears are all for you. I will listen to you for hours. So that by the time I decide to make a film, I know what I'm talking about and I know what has to be filmed. I, I don't come with an idea that I know what your life is and do that. I spend hours and hours of listening and I'm fascinated with human beings. <coughs> I think sometimes even the a person that you don't really care much about, if you sit with that person and start listening, that's the real learning process. And you learn things that you just can't imagine. I, I just very, uh, I think human beings are so special. I really do. So I never get tired of it. Um, question. Um, uh, Norman. Um, he broke the barrier. <laughs> Way to go. <laughs> um, I very much enjoyed uh, um, seeing how you kind of broke barriers. Uh, you created a, an alliance between yourself and the students within the community, within the classroom, which was in a certain kind of way very well, uh, a theater perhaps, but very well, you know, safe and protected for sure. I'm interested in what, what went on outside with yourself in terms of how you, uh, how you interacted with, with other colleagues and professors within the, the faculty within this department. Uh, as an instructor myself,
myself, I value very much the interaction I have with my colleagues, um, learning about what they're doing in their classes, how the students react to certain things, and they hear what I have to do, or what I'm doing, and how, uh, you know, kind of bouncing off uh, my ideas and <laughs> their, uh, their, their points of view. Can you tell us something about how you interacted and, 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 and worked with the rest of the faculty in, in terms of how they responded to the things that you were engaged in? Yeah, that, that's a very practical question.